Father God, uh, thank you for this beautiful Sunday evening, Lord, and I thank you that uh, we can gather together tonight as one body, Jesus, and that all over the country, all over the world, um, there are many other people like us worshiping you, uh, coming together to learn more about you, Jesus, and I thank you that tonight uh, we get to do that together in your presence. Lord, we love you, we praise you, and we thank you. In your name I pray, amen. 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 Hey, you guys can have a seat. Well, my name, as G alluded to, is Cameron, uh, Cameron Wells. I am from Bayside Church. Uh, I spent a number of years over there working with college students, and now I get the privilege of working with middle schoolers, so 6th, 7th, and 8th grade. Some would say I'm crazy. Um, I would probably agree, um, but it's a really fun, uh, it's a really fun time, and uh, I'm honored to be uh, with you today. <clears throat> I've got a wife and a little puppy. We're working on kids, so don't pressure us, but... Uh, our fur baby is enough for now. Uh, she's a little labradoodle. She's 10 months old. We call her Indy. Uh, my wife is Charmaine. And uh, so it's, it's interesting because um, I don't have an accent. I have a very American accent. Um, but I was thinking kind of on my way here that context is very important. Where you come from is very important. And who you are is very important. And if you study the Bible, context is everything. But in my family, um, it's a little different. So my wife is Australian, but originally her family is from Chile. So she's also South American. And, um, and so all of the time we get asked, as maybe you do, like, hey, uh, your accent, uh, what nationality are you? Where are you from? And so then she goes into the long you know, story of where her family's from and how they got to Australia. People don't ask me that. They just assume I come from a corner of the world where the sun doesn't exist and everybody just has pasty white skin like this. Um, and it's true. That, that is true. Um, but context is, is everything. And uh, G and I were just talking about, uh, we we're just talking about our marriages. And uh, I don't know if you guys know this, but I was doing some research because we got married about 10 months ago. We got married in November. And, uh, but I was doing some research on how much weddings cost today. Raise your hand if you're in this room and you're married. Okay, so we're a lot over. So if you're not married, I don't want this to scare you, okay? I want you to just, just roll with it. Um, I was doing some homework, and the average wedding in the United States today costs $33,000. I don't know about you, but that's a lot of money to me. So you can imagine my surprise when my wife, then fiance, came to me and said, Cameron, babe, honey, I think we need to get married three times. I said, what? She said, I think we need to get married three times. And I said, $33,000 times three, carry the, multiply the, I'm not good at math, but it was a lot of money. And I said, okay, please explain before I faint. And, and she said, well, um, you know, I don't think we have enough time to get all the paperwork done to get married in Australia. So I think that legally, we got to get married in California. And I said, okay, that makes sense. And she said, but my whole family is in Australia. So I think we have to have a wedding in Australia. And I said, okay, that makes sense too. She said, but uh, if we get married in Australia, a lot of people from California won't be able to go. So I think we need to have a California wedding too. And I said, Okay, I think that makes sense too. And so she said three weddings. And I said, okay. And somehow we made it work. I will probably be paying those weddings off until the day I die. But by gosh, we got married. And I'll tell you what. I'll tell you what. We were standing up on our wedding day in Australia. Sydney, Australia is where we got married. And I remember standing up at the altar. And I was a mess. Men, I don't know if you're brave enough to admit it. If you were too. But when my wife turned the corner and she started walking down the aisle, I fell apart. I had lived my entire life judging other guys who cried at their wedding. I was like, you are a sissy. And when my wife turned that corner, I fell apart. And I'm trying to get it back together. And somebody finally handed me a rag and I'm just like getting, trying to get all the tears off of my face. But I remember standing up there with my wife and what I was not thinking about was how much money it costs to be there. Plane tickets were very expensive. All of the decor is very expensive. You spend a lot of money on flowers at weddings for some reason, very expensive. 
But I remember I was not thinking about the money as I held her hands, looking into her eyes. I was not thinking about the money. What I was thinking about was the years and years and years of my life that had led to this moment. Because context is everything. And where you come from is very important. And one of the most influential figures in my life through the Bible, his name is Elijah. And in 1 Kings chapter 18, Elijah steps onto the scene. And at the time, God's people were not following God. They had fallen away. And so Elijah shows up and he says, there's going to be a drought for three years. For three years, there's going to be no water which today wouldn't be that big of a deal. California has been in a drought for like 155 years. Everybody keeps talking about it. But back then, they didn't have the type of technology to, to hold the water when it did rain. So three years without water literally meant that crops were dying, families were not getting enough water throughout the day. It was bad. And it all culminates in this one little chapter in 1 Kings 18. We have the slide. They just handed this to me. There we go. And it says this, Then the fire of the Lord fell and burned up the sacrifice, the wood, the stones. This is backwards. Bear with me. Here we go. So Elijah is at the top of this mountain. He says, Three years, no rain. Three years goes by. And finally, God says, Hey, Elijah, it's time. So Elijah goes to the top of this mountain, and he challenges the prophets of Baal, to this showdown at the top of a mountain. And it says this, he arranged the wood, cut the bowl into pieces and laid it on the wood. Then he said to them, fill four large jars with water and pour it on the offering and on the wood. Do it again, he said, and they did it again. Do it a third time, he ordered, and they did it a third time. Elijah took 12 stones, one for each of the tribes descended from Jacob to whom the word of the Lord had come saying, your name shall be Israel. With the stones, he built an altar in the name of the Lord. He dug a trench around it large enough to hold two seas of water. <clears throat> he arranged the wood, and they poured water on it. So basically, they get to the top of this mountain, and Elijah challenges the prophets of Baal. He says, hey, we'll both build two altars. We'll sacrifice a bull, and whichever God answers, that's the God that we'll serve. Your God, Baal, or my God, Jesus. And so they build their altars, and Elijah lets them go first. And it's really entertaining in 1 Kings chapter 18, because he lets them go first, but then after a while, obviously, nothing's happening. So he starts to taunt them. He goes, oh, maybe your God's sleeping. Maybe your God is going to the bathroom. Maybe he can't hear you. And then after 12 hours have passed, Elijah says, all right, it's my turn. So Elijah gathers up the bowl, he creates his altar, and he begins to prepare it. And then he just decides to up the crazy level. See, not only does he build the altar, and not only does he put the bull on the altar, just like the prophets of Baal had, but he goes one step further. Elijah grabs the people around him and he says, hey, do we have water? And they say, well, we're in a drought, so not a lot. And he said, I have these four jars. I want you to fill them up with water, and then I want you to pour them on the altar. And at this point, people are thinking, Elijah, the altar is supposed to catch fire. Fire and water don't mix. He's like, I just need you to, I just need you to trust me. And so they get four jars of water, and they pour it on the altar three times. So much so that they had, they had created a moat that went around the altar and even that filled with water. So the altar is doused in water. And people are starting to think, how is this very wet altar going to catch fire? And then Elijah prays. In 1 Kings chapter 18, one of the most profound prayers in all of the Bible. And it says this. At the time of sacrifice, the prophet Elijah stepped forward and prayed, Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known today that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant, and I've done all these things at your command. Answer me, Lord, answer me, so these people will know that you, Lord, are God and that you are turning their hearts back again. 
the more I read the Bible, the more I realize that God doesn't actually care about our context. God doesn't actually care about our history. Because I tell you what, as we're standing up on our wedding day, I wasn't thinking about the money. I wasn't thinking about the plane flights. I was actually thinking about my relationship with my dad. And I'll just get a little vulnerable tonight. I did not have a great relationship with my dad. It's been up and down, but we had a really tough time. And standing up there on my wedding day, it took me back to a conversation I had had with my dad years before. A conversation I can still remember every single word that he said. A conversation that rocked me to my core. And that was what I brought with me on my wedding day. Not the money, the travel. What I brought with me on my wedding day was the hurt from my past. And not too much longer uh, after our wedding, we go on our honeymoon and uh, we got to play this beautiful golf course off the coast of Australia. And my dad loves golf. And he had just really been on my heart. And I felt like God was really just telling me, like, go after your dad, be in a relationship with your dad. So we're at this beautiful golf course, and I'm taking all of these pictures of all the holes in the country club and the, the boat ride that we took to get there, all these pictures of the golf course. And I'm sending them all to my dad. I'm like, hey, dad, thinking about you. I get that when you're on your honeymoon and you text somebody thinking about you, it's really weird. I get that. I don't know what I was thinking. But I sent all this to my dad, and I'm just waiting for him to respond. I'm like, we're going to bond over this. It's going to be great. And I remember sending all of these pictures, and all I got in response was a one-word answer. I got a text message that simply read, cool. And I remember after all of these years of carrying this stuff around with my dad, after trying to reach out, after trying to love him, after trying to bond, I got a one-word response. And I remember in that moment, all of that anger and all of that hurt kind of bubbled to the surface. And then I took it to God. And I told God all of my frustrations. And I told God all of my hurts and all of my anger. And when I took it to God, I got a one word response. Stay. Stay. No matter how much he doesn't engage, no matter how hurt you are, no matter how angry you are, stay in your dad's life. Because God doesn't care about history. God doesn't care what happened with my dad. God wants me to love my dad. And I realized in that moment that context does not mean as much to God as it means to us. Which is why when I read this in 1 Kings chapter 18, it doesn't seem as crazy to me anymore, but I have to wonder, in a three-year drought, when Elijah tells the people, pour water on the altar, they're thinking, Elijah has lost his mind. You need some water. Because there hadn't been any water for three years. But they pour water on the altar and something amazing happens. You see, the point is this. Shortly after this prayer, the fire falls from heaven. The fire falls from heaven, and it licks up the entire altar. It says the sacrifice, the wood, the stones, and the soil, and it also licked up all of the water in the trench. When all of the people saw this, they fell to the ground and cried. The altar that Elijah had dumped water on, caught fire. And not only did it catch fire, but so much so that nothing was left. But the prophets of Baal had, had tried all day to get their God to respond. But what you have to understand is that the sacrifice was the same. They both built altars. They both sacrificed a bull on top. The sacrifice was the same, but the cost was not. Elijah's sacrifice cost him so much more because Elijah gave what was most precious to him. You see, God may not care about context, but it's a big deal for us. There had been no rain. Water was the most precious thing that they had. And so Elijah took the most precious thing that they had and he dumped it over this altar and said, God, I need you to show up. 
And because Elijah gave the most precious thing that he had, God showed up. God responded. The altar was lit. Don't give what you have, give what you need. But I would also say this, is that God is not exempt from this. We do not follow a God that asks us to do something he's not willing to do. Because thousands of years before, he had a problem. He had created man, but sin entered the world. And all of a sudden, there was a divide. There was a divide between him and between his creation. And what God needed was family. And so what he gave was family. It says in John 3.16 that he gave his only son who came to earth and died on the cross for our sins so he could call us family again. When Jesus came to the cross, it wasn't just something that he did. It was something he came to establish. Because the cross was not just the mission. It wasn't just Jesus' mission. It was the method. And when Jesus died on that cross, he was telling all of us today and throughout history, this is how you love people. It's sacrifice. It's sacrifice. And what Elijah proved on that mountain that day is that if you want to see God move in your life, it starts with sacrifice. But it isn't sacrifice if it doesn't cost you anything. In John 15, verse 12, it says that greater love has no one than this, that he would lay down his life for his friends. Greater love has no one than this. Greater love is sacrifice. Greater love is sacrifice. So I just want to challenge you tonight, challenge you today with something that just has really been on my heart because in Romans 12, 1, it calls us to be living sacrifices. How do we be a living sacrifice? How do we live with love? It's that every day you're building something for God. And at the end of your life, you're going to present God your altar and you're going to say, God, this is what I built for you. Every day, you get up on that altar. Because I would challenge you with this. Maybe you're thinking, like, Cameron, I don't know, I don't know what to bring to God. My past is pretty messed up. Cameron, I've got a drug addict background. I don't know what to bring to God. Cameron, I'm kind of a screw-up. I'm kind of a failure. I don't really know what I'm good at. I don't see how God could use me. But God just wants you to bring the most precious thing that you have. And today, the, the most precious thing that you have, it's not water. We've got plenty of water. It's not your talent. God has plenty of talent. The most precious thing that you have is you. The most precious thing that you have is you. Would you give God the most precious thing that you have? And would we live lives of living sacrifices that every day I wake up in the morning, I say, God, I am not my own. I'm yours. Use me. God, love somebody through me. And every day we climb up on that altar and we give up our own wants, we give up our own desires, knowing that when we give God the most precious thing that we have, fire from heaven will fall. I'm going to invite the band back up. And I just want to read to you as they come up the very end of this story. It says, The fire of the Lord fell and burned up the sacrifice, the wood, the stones, and the soil, and it also licked up the water in the trench. When all the people saw this, they fell prostrate and cried, The Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God. And I realized after reading through this story a few times that not only did the fire consume the altar, but it lit a fire in everybody watching. And if you want to have the kind of faith that's marked by God's consuming fire, and if you want to have the kind of faith that isn't just about you, but it lights the fire in other people, 
I would challenge you. Would you bring God the most precious thing that you own, the most precious thing that you have? It's you. It's you. Would you say, God, I'm letting go of my past. I'm letting go of my hurt. I'm letting go of my anger. None of that matters anymore. Here I am. Use me, God. Send me, God. Love me, God. Because I'll tell you this, love that costs nothing changes nothing. But love that costs everything changes everything. When Jesus died on the cross that day, it cost him everything. But it changed everything for you and for me. Will we be living sacrifices and give up who we are and where we're from so we could step into everything that God has for us? The band's gonna go into one more song. And I just wanna encourage you As they do, I just wanna encourage you, if you need to come forward and you need to pray with somebody, come forward and pray. If you need to get on your knees before God, get on your knees before God. If you need to lift up your hands, lift up your hands and worship. But either way, would you tonight make a decision to be a living sacrifice? Would you tonight let go of everything that you have been and were and step into everything that God has for you? Would you make that decision tonight? Would you just do something with me tonight? Would you just raise your hands up like this, if you would? And we're going to pray one last time together. Father God, Lord, we lift our hands and surrender to you. Jesus, I pray that you would use us in spite of our past, in spite of our hurt, in spite of our anger. Father God, tonight, I pray that we would lay that down on the altar. Jesus, and that we would give you all of us, not just some of us, but all of us, God. Thank you for moving in this place, God. Thank you for calling us your own. Thank you for loving us. Jesus, we love you, and we thank you. In your name we pray, amen.